Have you ever wondered how a bird could produce such melody and song? Have you marveled at the interrelationships in all living systems? Our next lecture will fascinate you and inspire appreciation for the Creator. Welcome to session number five of Creation in Symphony. We've talked about the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth days of creation, about the early part of the sixth day of creation, and we're going to major on the unique and ultimate design in the creation man. I'd like to emphasize that the infrastructure and interrelation and codependency of the entire creation are foundations for God to then create man in his own image. We have a wonderful, high, lofty, and noble position to fulfill. The background is that everything is interrelated. None of this creation is dependent on man for its existence. But man is dependent on the entire creation for his existence. There is a book I'd like to recommend to you from which we got a number of ideas and confirmation in uh, scholastic background showing the interrelationship of various life forms from moles to insects to fungi to bacteria and in other publications the interrelationship in the marine ventures uh, the cleansing effect of clams sewage disposal units in the hard shells or shelled fish all of this is a part of the interrelated infrastructure of planet Earth to make it a habitable place to live. The book I want to recommend to you is a book published from the evolutionary standpoint. Now that's rare for me to say. I rarely recommend text with which I would disagree in, in concept. This book is called The Way Nature Works. We handle it at the Creation Evidences Museum. Of course, we have a stamp inside which states that we do not agree with the evolutionary concepts. However, this book is filled with information more than any other single volume I've ever seen in 35 years of academic research on this subject. Filled with information regarding the infrastructure of all of life systems. It would be very easy for a family studying the creation enterprise to see various ways that evolution has no explanation for what's going on. For instance, here is a special plant in the rainforest, and there's a special ant that makes his home inside that plant. That plant cannot live without the ant, and this particular ant cannot live well without the plant. The entire book is filled with the ecosphere, the environment, and all of nature as being orchestrated. And of course, it gives reference to the fact that Nature is a wonderful orchestrator. It's a wonderful orchestrator only because a creator designed every single tenant. In this creation, leading up to the design and expression of God's image in man, there are some marvelously ingenious characteristics that are intrinsic to the very nature of life itself. For instance, animals can make and use tools Chimpanzees use a stick or grass to fish termites. When water is not readily available, they chew leaves for a sponge and soak up the small amounts of water that would be available. The gorilla uses often a crooked stick to pull fruit closer to him. Elephants scratch their backs with sticks. The California sea otter uses a stone to crack the clam shells that is just retrieved from the bottom of the lagoon. Galapagos woodpecker finches use a stick to fish for grubs. The satin bower bird uses a paintbrush of bark to paint his bower. These are ingenious marks of design and ingenuity in the very innate nature of these creatures. Some animals even use medicine. Chimps ignore a leaf of Aspilia shrub until they're sick. But once they're sick, they chew this leaf, it kills disease-causing bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Pregnant elephants consume specific plants just before giving birth to the young. All of this is use of medication. The southwestern bears chew up 
root of a particular plant, smear it on their paws and fur as an antibacterial insecticide. These creatures are wonderfully designed. One scientist enjoyed writing about a story. He was a researcher and had uh, or has a cabin off in the wilds where he goes on the weekends to get away from the pressure of his lab and his academic research. As he was leaving his cabin one Sunday afternoon to go back to the city, he decided to see how ingenious the local ants would be. So he took a tub and partially filled it with water, put a four-cornered stool in it in the water, and on top of the stool, he put a little saucer of chocolate. To make the task very difficult, he used a slow-drying glue and painted the outside of the tub. He smiled to himself and said, there's no way those ants can get to this. It was under his porch, and he decided to come back the next weekend. When he returned the following weekend, he found a very ingenious enterprise had taken place. The ants had sacrificed some of their own as they started up the glue. And in a single file, not in a mass mob throng, in single file, one at after another had sacrificed his life to build a bridge over the glue. And then, once they passed the glue, other ants went all the way down to the inside of the tub. And then they used various sticks and various grasses to build a raft. And it led as a bridge all the way to the leg of the stool. They climbed up and they were eating the chocolate. Other very venturesome ants had climbed up the interior of the ceiling of the porch had calculated exactly where the chocolate was and fell directly into their prize. Now that in some respects is more intelligent than I've observed individuals operating in the traffic of Dallas, Texas. I would say it takes some very special enterprise to do that. So we find some unusual characteristics in the animal world. Giraffes have a wonder net for blood at the base of their brain. You remember they have high necks, and they have to bend over for water. Were it not for that wonder net, the pressure would throb in their brains and actually they would hemorrhage. But there's a wonder net that restricts the flow. In addition to that, they have a series of one-way valves working through the neck. In fact, an entire book was written, The Neck of the Giraffe, indicating that evolutionists have major problems. And one is the very neck of the giraffe itself. There's a lot of ingenuity going on. For instance, birds have a very sophisticated communication system. I mentioned that in the last lecture. Let me elucidate a little further and show you exactly how sophisticated some of these birds can be. There is a cowbird that often pairs with mates not within its immediate vicinity. There's a songless cowbird and some female songless cowbirds paired with some singing male cowbirds from another vicinity, and their song was entirely different than that of the cowbirds of this immediate area. Yet, the male cowbirds that did the singing ended up singing the melody exactly like the local cowbirds sing. Now, the female companions had actually used flutters and brushes without ever uttering a sound to teach them to sing like the other fellows in the area sing. That's absolutely ingenious. That's an innate ability designed by the Creator Himself. Birds migrate by the use of the sun, internal clocks, star patterns, odors from pine trees, wind-generated low-frequency sound, pressure sensors in their middle ears, and magnetic field lines. Marvelous ingenuity in the creation. The little flea has intrigued my study in recent days. I don't care too much about fleas. I'm just trying to show you the ingenious design 
in all of nature. The little flea has springs that are powered in his joints. He releases five and a half times the energy that the most perfect muscle can generate through these little springs. Small pads of a natural protein, rubber, called resilin, in the legs. He slowly depresses the pads, stores the energy, and in one-seventh of the time it took him to store it, he can release it and thus jump tall buildings with a single bound. He's an incredible little creature. Now, other creatures are amazing. For instance, electric fish are aware of the geometry of their field, Smithsonian Magazine stated. They have receptors all over their bodies. To the shark, the ocean is a maze of electric signposts. Lobsters have half a million receptors on their bodies. They live in a universe continually surrounded by ever-changing chemical odors. Many animals, especially some insects, repeatedly sense a magnetic universe by means of ferromagnetic crystals in their brains. And some researchers have indicated that man also has small amounts of ferromagnetic material in his brain. This would indicate that when man's genetic expression was more optimal and man's ecosphere was more pristine, the pre-flood world, it could have been a paradise for man. In fact, I brought to the studio today an impact article from Institute for Creation Research talking about legends among the ancients in all parts of the world about a time in the past when man lived in greater bliss. For instance, Hesiod, around the 8th century BC, stated that the Kronos people lived like gods, carefree in their hearts, shielded from pain and misery. Helpless old age did not exist. They didn't sag, their limbs didn't sag with lack of vigor. A sleep like death subdued them. And every good thing was theirs. The barley giving earth asked for no toil to bring forth a rich and plentiful harvest. Man was suited for his environment according to those legends. Now, it's been found by anthropologists and sociologists and historians that legends have a basis in fact. They may have been embellished, but they have a basis in fact. The Sumerians have a paradise myth. Ancient Egypt has a paradise myth in which there was plenty of food for the bellies of the people. No sand on earth. A crocodile did not cease prey. Now that is extremely interesting. The crocodile did not cease prey. The serpent did not bite. And everyone enjoyed blissful recreation together. In China, the great Taoist teacher Quang Si stated in the 4th century BC, the birds and the beast in the past multiplied to flocks and herds. The grass and trees grew luxuriant and long. The birds and beasts might be led about without feeling the constraint. There was perfect virtue. Well, there's indication in all of the basic civilizations that in a time in the past, beyond the records of man, there was a blissful creation. Is that possible? In our creation model, We've emphasized that the atmospheric pressure was correct, the nutrient supply was correct, the internal structure of the earth was correct, the information feeding in from cosmic radiation was correct, the magnetic field was maintained in its appropriate intensity or moment. That's the energy of that field. Let's see if that's plausible. I was at Texas A&M University doing some research. Dr. William Fife in the hyperbaric medical lab learned of the research that we're doing. And uh, he said, I want to tell you something that I saw firsthand. He said, I was in this facility. It was not on campus at A&M, but another facility. He said it was a huge uh, avian habitat, a huge birdcage. And they had a circulation pool at the bottom, a pool of water. And he said, after a couple of years, the birds had saturated, and they decided that they wanted to use some fish in the water to add some variety. So he said they chose the most aggressive native 
predatorial North American freshwater fish they could find. Now think for a moment. The most aggressive native North American freshwater fish. And they found that to be the trout. The trout will go for more kinds of bait or food than any other fish that we know that's freshwater in North America. So they put fingerling trout in there, in these waters. And they tried to feed them, but the trout wouldn't eat anything. They continued to try. He said they tried grains, fresh baits, worms, minnows, artificial baits. They tried everything. Couldn't get them to eat anything. Yet, Dr. Fife related, he said those fish got big. He said, I saw them personally, and when they took them out, those trout were huge like that, but they had never eaten anything. They finally found that it was the bird droppings. Remember, the ecosphere is totally balanced. The bird droppings falling into the water and the nutrient supply assimilated into the aqueous medium, into the water, and the trout simply assimilated the nutrients and had all they wanted. They were not aggressive. They wouldn't go after other fish, minnows, or anything. Now that says something about the pristine world before the flood. We know that violence filled the earth through man. Man can teach nature to be violent. But nature by itself was not violent. So when some of the legends of the past indicate that the crocodile didn't bite and the serpent did not aggressively pursue the prey, I think there's a basis in truth there because all of the environment and all of the living creatures were satisfied. If God satisfied them, wouldn't he satisfy man? There is a book called The Tuning of the World. That gives the daily, weekly, monthly, and annual migration of sound sources. Here we have the rain and the snow, the water and the ice. Before the flood of Noah's day, those, of course, would not have been existent. But then we have the grasshoppers and insects, the bees, the mosquitoes. And by the way, the mosquitoes. Let's talk about that for a moment. In such an environment as this, the mosquitoes would provide no problem. You see, it's the female mosquito who bites. And she bites out of nutritional need just before she lays her eggs. In this environment and ecosphere, there would be no need. And therefore, she would not have to search for additional oxygen in your blood supply and additional nutrients in your blood supply with the slightly enriched oxygen, with the dual atmospheric pressure, she could be satisfied with all of the oxygen supply she needed. So the buzzing of the mosquitoes in the original pristine world was not for our detriment, but for our benefit as well. Flies, now especially the bird song, the frog song, the wolves, and the elk. Let's look at the bird song and the frog, frog song. There is a peak, a seasonal peak of spring, leveling off through the summer, tapering into the fall, and back to the winter in the bird song. There's also a daily peak of the bird song. The birds begin to sing a little after four o'clock. There's a peak to these, a climax around six o'clock, tapers down, and then in late afternoon, it peaks again and tapers for the night. There is a design in all of that for the benefit of man. Let's talk about man for a little while. You've been taught in evolutionary theory that man is really a complicated ape. In fact, you've been taught that the ape has so many characteristics with man that there are actually very little, very few differences between man and ape. That an ape is 98.4% genetically identical with man. Well, he is, because an ape has a structure of hands, an arm, slightly different, but he has that structure. A basic torso, lungs, all of that's genetic information. Feet and legs, spinal column, brain, the skull, eyes, skin, hair, 
all of those involve genetic specific information. But it's that 1.6% difference. Evolutionists have indicated, well, man is so close to ape, or ape is so close to man, it really wouldn't be difficult to see how we could bridge the gap for that 1.6% difference from ape to man. We have a chart in which I stated you can't produce these from apes or an ape-like creature. These are beautiful children from around the world. And I used the information by genetic specialist Dr. Barney Maddox. In print, he stated that the important point is that science has now quantitated that a genetic mutation, a change in the genetic information of as little as one billionth of an animal's genome is relentlessly fatal. Now, I want you to get that. The current leading scholar in the human genome is Dr. Francis Cullen. Dr. Collins is a creationist, but he's recognized worldwide as the leading geneticist, and he is the man in charge of structuring and analyzing and mapping the human genome. Well, from some of that information, and from independent research, Dr. Barney Maddox, with specialization in this area, has now stated, with academic justification, if you want to change that genetic information, a mutational change as little as one billionth of an animal's genome is relentlessly fatal. An accumulation of as little as three genetic mutations causes a fatality either now or before that individual, that creature, whatever it be, can reproduce. And he's addressed this matter of the ape being 98.4% that of man. Now, the genetic difference between human and his nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of at least 48 million nucleotides and a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an animal. There's no possibility of change. I'm simply saying that when you look at the facts as they are, it is impossible to get an ape to evolve to become a man. Man is absolutely unique. Let's see how unique man really is. Let's talk about the chromosomal numbers in the cellular structure. The evolutionary theorist would like to have us think that you start with an earthworm and you progress logically up the phyla of life, a vector of progress, and you end with man. But each creature is genetically independent, is unique in its function and interrelationship in the entire biosphere of planet Earth. For instance, a worm has two chromosomes in the cell. A mosquito has six. The vinegar fly has eight. The house fly has 12. The onion has 16. The cabbage has 18. The Indian corn has 20. The bean has 22. Yellow pine and the tomato have 24. The honey bee has 32. The cat has 38. The mouse has 40. Rat and wheat have 42. Human, 46. Tobacco, 48. There are other life forms that have measurably, astronomically measurably, more chromosomes than we have if that's the function we're looking for. Cotton has 52 chromosomes in the cell. Sheep have 54. Cattle have 60. The horse has 66. The dog and the chicken both have 78. Now, isn't that a relationship? There is no rhyme, nor reason, nor form, nor progression an evolutionary concept that could interrelate these logically. The goldfish has 94. The crawfish has 100 chromosomes, and the shrimp has 254 chromosomes. A leading expert has stated, Arthur Keith, has stated that there are 312 characteristics that are found only in man. What about man? 
The human brain of man has 100 trillion cells and 100 million separate signals throughout the body every second. Did you get that? The human brain has 100 trillion cells and 100 million separate signals throughout the body every single second of our existence. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. This data is given in the Moody video series, Wonders of God's Creation. And in that same series they stated, if we learn something new every second, it would take three million years to exhaust the capacity of the brain. I want to dwell on that for a moment. Man was not designed for a limited trek on planet Earth. Man in the entire creation, in original design, were structured to live forever. That's clear in the biblical record and in the creation model. Now, we thought in a matter of a few hundred years I could exhaust the capacity of the brain. Not so. If we learn something new every second, it would take three, hundred, three million years to exhaust the capacity of the brain. Now, let's take it further than that. It has been found recently that the immune system, under certain conditions, kicks in to different production of different enzymatic responses so that it becomes an entirely different machine. I suspect that the human brain would do that, but I don't know of any friends who have exhausted all the supply of their brains, so we haven't found if the human brain can do that. But let's learn a few more things about it. The human body can make painkillers automatically that can treat cough, anxiety, high blood pressure, depression, asthma, colds, arthritis, ulcers, high cholesterol, and even warts, all innately by the design of the system, built in, designed in, painkillers, and treatment. In fact, many theorists speculate that what we do in medication simply lets the body do what it was designed to do in correcting itself. Recently, a computer chip was designed to begin to do what the retina of the eye does. But this computer chip weighs 100 pounds. Yours weighs less than a gram. It occupies, yours occupies, 0 0.0003 inches in space. The scientist chip occupies 10,000 cubic inches. Your retina operates on 0 0.0001 watt of power, one ten thousandth watt of power. Theirs operates on 300 watts of power and requires a cooling system. Theirs only resolves 2,000 pixels. Yours dissolves 10,000 pixels. And yours has the equivalent of 1 million transistors. Theirs has the equivalent of 1 million transistors. Yours has the equivalent of 10 billion transistors. Your brain has 10 billion neurons, each with 25,000 connections to other neurons. This allows your finger to feel vibrations of 8 one thousandth of an inch and lets you see 10 million different colors. That brain directs the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system. That brain is absolutely astounding. How intelligent were you supposed to be? Class, let's think about this for a moment. How smart were you really supposed to be? A lot smarter than any of us has developed to be. At the Creation Evidences Museum, we're in the process of operating functional experiments, not on human beings, but on animals and other creatures in the biota. We have control groups, and ultimately, if the Creator gives us enough time, we'd like to see how much more intelligent creatures would be under pre-flood conditions, simulated, than they are, their counterparts are, today. Your brain was designed for you to function optimally. Let's get a handle on that. There is a condition known today as idiot savant syndrome, where an individual with a very low IQ of maybe 10 or 11 
who would be known as an idiot, also has very unique capabilities, ingenious capacities that can only be understood in a creation concept, certainly would not fit in an evolutionary scenario. Let me see if I can justify what I just said. This idiot savant condition is caused when the left hemisphere of the brain is underdeveloped due to accident, due to various factors, and the right hemisphere of the brain is able to develop with genetic optimal expression. What happens under those conditions? There's an individual who was simply designated as K, 28 years of age and had a middle age of 11 and a vocabulary of only 58 words, yet K could remember at will the population of every United States city over 5,000 in population, the distances of every city from New York to Chicago between each other, every county seat in the entire nation, the names, locations, number of rooms, and over 2,000 hotels in the United States. Now, here's an individual who had a vocabulary of 58 words. Yet, that individual's interest was in these particular areas, and I doubt if there's an individual, even if it's a college professor listening to this video, who is able to optimally express that kind of capacity. But you were designed to have that kind of capacity with both hemispheres of your brain optimally genetically expressed. In the 1700s, there was a fellow named Jedediah Buxton, had a middle age of 10, had to be guarded wherever he went. Yet, Jedediah had never studied math, knew nothing of scholastics, but could calculate any mathematical problem instantly. For instance, a committee knew an answer, they calculated an answer, and they asked him a question. And this is documented. They said, how many one-eighths of an inch exist in a cube? 23,145,789 yards by 5,642,732 yards by 54,965 yards. Jedediah instantly gave them the 28-digit correct answer. Now that's how smart you're supposed to be. There's an individual alive today, blind and mentally retarded, Leslie Lemke. Leslie is a musical genius. He didn't walk until he was age 20. The nurse who took him home is a blob of unrelated flesh from the nursery where his parents said they certainly didn't want him, became his mother. She strapped him to her back as she did the housework at home. Leslie lived, learned to walk. At about age 20, he said his first word. One day with his mother, he said, love. His mother was shocked. She said, what does love mean to you? He stumbled over to the piano, sat down and played, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Leslie can hear any piece on a number of instruments and instantly play it and return the play at will. He once heard a 45-minute concert, symphonic concert played, and he sat down and played every single note and the tune and the rhythm perfectly after one hearing. Now that's how intelligent, that's how artful you are designed to be. I'm trying to tell you that man was the climax of God's creation. With the ability to recognize the Creator and the ability to worship that Creator and to appreciate the fact that He was created. I've mentioned in other sessions that physicists are now recognizing that man, by the will of thought alone, can change the radiation rate 
of atomic materials. Man is able to do things by thought processes alone and the mass of the proton or the energy of the proton and the two are interchangeable is directly related to the thought process of man according to a number of physicists. Now, look at this marvelous body. Cut yourself. Instantly, there's a series of precisely ordered steps set in motion. While the scab is forming on the surface, blood below is making another kind of clot of blood, platelets and protein. With the bleeding stopped, the flow of blood increases, enriched with white blood cells, and their purpose is to search and kill germs and to clean the wound of damaged cellular tissue. Some 45 minutes ago, one of the dear members of this team in the studio fell outside the studio on concrete, a dear lady. And at this very moment, the wound of her face and hands is automatically being cleansed and the repair process has already begun. There is no way fortuitous evolutionary processes could envision the repair of systems like this, yet they're going on billions of times every day around the world in biological systems, and of course, hundreds of thousands of times in the wounds of man. Back to the concept. These white blood cells search and kill germs and clean the wound of damaged cellular tissue. Skin cells increase the rate of new cells to bridge the cut. Underneath, fibroblast cells fill the wound to strengthen and contract to pull the wound back together. Can you imagine your Ferrari, Mercedes-Benz, or Porsche repairing itself? I'm sure your Chevrolet won't repair itself. All of this has to be designed ingeniously. And then the blood vessels and nerves complete and the fibroblasts arrange in lines of stress around the wound so that often the wound is stronger than it was before. It's incredible. Liver in the body, about the size of a football, three pounds, has over 500 tasks linked to the heart, lungs, and digestive system. We learned just recently that the human mind unconsciously can reason, anticipate consequences, and devise plans all without knowing they do so according to Scientific American. Now, this is all a part of the infrastructure of an orchestrated creation. Evolutionist Freeman Dyson stated, the mind plays an essential role in the functioning of the universe. George Wall, Nobel laureate, suggests that man has a spirit and consciousness outside of space and time. Scientists have found that DNA has a built-in error correction system with a number of key enzymes within the cell with one job to find and correct errors. As we began this particular video production, we queried into the question about can an ape become a man? You see, inside the cellular structure of all living systems, there are enzymes that actually protect that DNA information. And to the degree that the environment permits it to be done, will actually find and correct deficits, deficiencies, and incorrect areas. Well, it all looks like it was designed. Now to a special area of research. One of our consultants at the Creation Evidences Museum is Professor Emmy Clark, University of Illinois, Professor Emeritus. Professor Clark lectures on both sides of the Iron Curtain on the human cardiovascular system. He is the world's foremost expert on the hydrology of the global flood, and we will refer to his work in one of the next forthcoming lectures. Don't miss a single lecture. Professor Clark has spent more than 30 years searching into a unique characteristic, a couple of unique characteristics. One is the circle of Willis in the base of the skull under the brain. The other is fetal development, development of the child. 
Now, Professor Clark went back to some original work and he enhanced that work. The Circle of Willis. Here is the entire cardiovascular system illustrated with the blood flow. Here is the brain illustrated. There's a design in all of this. Professor Clark lectures so articulately on the fact that there is a circle. Every organ in the body is unique and is important. But the other organs cannot function without organ number one, which is the human brain. In order to provide sufficient blood to that brain, there is a structure, a unique structure at the base of the skull. And if one artery is clogged or impeded, the brain is provided sufficient reserve of blood with only the slightest impedance. All of that was designed into the structure of man. Can you imagine in the pre-flood world the ability of man to live? Today we function only to a degree of our genetic capacity because of lack of oxidization in the brain among other things. It stated that a seal the little creature, the seal, can hold his breath for over an hour underwater because of the pressure involved. In a pre-flood world, with man having his brain fully oxygenated and having the marvelous, miraculous circle of Willis to feed his brain sufficiently with oxygenized, oxygenized blood, nutrients to the brain, etc., man would live in a miracle dimension. I mention one final enterprise. Creation Research Institute in El Cajon, California has recently presented an article having to do with the mother's milk. And that article shows that researchers in Houston, Texas Paul Palma, M.D., and Eugene Adcock, M.D., of the University of Texas Medical Center, along with Dr. Buford Nickel of the Children's Nutrition Research Center in Houston, have found that the micro and macronutrients provide a chorus of voices inside the mother's milk. It's been found simultaneously that the male chromosomes during fetal development, chromosomes and genes provided by the male, sperm, actually provide organelles that live on the surface of the fetus and adjust the mother's immune system so that mother will not reject the body of that little child, that fetus, that individual growing within her body. All of this is marvelous. These researchers have found that the blood and the milk of the mother are changed to meet the needs of the infant. For instance, if an infant is born prematurely, there is a 20% variation in micronutrient high protein content because that prenatal care requires that kind of concern. All of that is designed in the mother's milk. The immune system is developed as a result of the mother's milk. And if the child, watch closely, I have no idea how an evolutionist would explain this. I used to be an evolutionist. I was wrong. This has to be designed and created. If the child has been exposed to an infection in those early weeks of his life. The feedback as that child nurses the mother literally changes the structure of the mother's milk and in a few hours she produces antibodies for the sake of that nursing child. My friends, I'm glad you came to class today. Hopefully I can do something to let you know 
that we were designed, that the human body was designed, that the entire ecosphere, the entire universe were interstructurally designed in what we call creation and symphony. Now that wonderful world climaxed on day number seven when the Creator rested. Not because he was tired, but because he was finished. Man was designed to represent the Creator who had designed him. Yet, as the Creator needed fellowship with a companion, not unlike himself, who would volitionally respond to him, man. So man, in turn, needed a companion, not unlike himself, who would volitionally, by choice, respond to him and be an helpmeet. So the final mark of the creation is womankind. And in that creation, God expressed and accumulated the beauty and the charm of all the creation in one vibrant personality. That means, lady, you have a lot to live up to. That means, sir, she deserves your attention. Don't miss the next lecture. Let's see what happened to this wonderful world that God created, how cataclysm changed it, and the resultant activities of a worldwide flood. Have you noticed that our symphonic creation is marred by discord? What happened? Don't miss our last lecture.